Okay, well, good afternoon. Very happy to come here today and talk to you. Um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, so my name is Dr. Jeremy Whitlock. I am what they call a reactor physicist by training. Went to Waterloo for physics and then McMaster University for, for two more degrees in nuclear engineering. And a reactor physicist is somebody who works on a team of designers, analysts, uh, designing reactors. And I've worked on all types of reactors from the big candy <coughs> reactors down to small research <coughs> reactors, research reactors that are the size of this chair here. Uh, and then in the last few years, I've moved over to what's called non-proliferation and safeguards, which um, you're aware of those terms. And, and uh, what I do, first of all, at Chalk River, we have lots of non-proliferation and safeguards work as part of our um, op regular operations, because we have all sorts of types of nuclear material up there that has to be safeguarded. So the operations folks look after that. My area is more the, the R&D, making uh, better detectors for detecting nuclear material, helping the, the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, in their inspection efforts. Um, the mem member states for the IAEA uh, help, the, help that agency out by producing technologies and methodology sometimes to help them uh, catch the bad guys. And so that's what we do. One of the hats that I wear is I, hello, hello, come on in, we, we just started. One of the hats that I wear is I, I, I travel around and talk to people, so very happy to be here today to do that. My talk is, uh, I understand, about going to be about an hour long, and then we have time for, lots of time for questions and answers. So if it's a, if it's a discussion point uh, to get into, I would assume that will be in the question and answer period at the end. But if it's a quick clarification, or what, did, what the heck did you just say, what does that mean? By all means, interrupt me as I'm talking. I'm going to go through, uh, in general, nuclear energy in Canada. Not just nuclear electricity generation, because I thought you'd also be interested in what do we do with nuclear science and technology in, in Canada. Not many Canadians know that this is a big part of, of Canadian expertise that we, we make available to the world, like helping the, the IAEA. Um, most people are aware that we have nuclear reactors, power reactors, and that, that's about it. So they don't know that we have nuclear medicine. Uh, well, they've heard of nuclear medicine in the hospitals. How many knew that Canada invented nuclear medicine? Uh, cobalt cancer therapy machines invented by, by Canadians. Um, and which, which is sad, and it's partly our fault too for not, not spreading the word better ov over the years. Um, that's my email address, and I think I have it at the end, last slide again too, so if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to, to, uh, to write me. Mm -hmm. I also have a website, the address is at the end, it's called the Nuclear FAQ, and the address is nuclearfaq.ca. And again, that's everything you wanted to know about nuclear, but we're afraid to ask and my email is on there too. This opening slide is just a nice one that I like putting up. It's nothing to do with Ch Chalk River, where I come from, but this is the Pickering Nuclear Station near here. And there's eight reactors there. And when this was built, it was the largest nuclear station in the world. And it basically provided Toronto, the area, the size of Toronto with, with electricity. And this is a, an experiment, was an experimental uh, well, still is. Uh, it's a small wind turbine, but when it was built there, it was the first one in Ontario, built by the Ontario Power Generation. And it's just a nice picture because there's, you know, it's a sunny day and kids are playing the beach. So I come, and Shelley comes from, well, not anymore, she just moved to an office in Ottawa, but uh, we come from Chalk River Laboratories. This is the, the mothership of Atomic Energy of Canada, or AACL. AACL is a crown corporation. It was created in 1952 with a mission to oversee the nuclear program in Canada. Everything to do with nuclear research in, in Canada. Nuclear medicine, nuclear power, uh, nuclear uh, helping geology, uh, building detectors, um, research reactors. And it inherited this from the National Research Council, the NRC. The first part of my talk is going to be uh, history and we'll get into all that interesting stuff because you have to know where you came from to know where you are and where you're, where you're going. Uh, so here's Ontario, if you're wondering where Chalk River is. Um, you been to Ottawa? Anyone? Okay, so we're about two hours west of Ottawa on the border with Quebec. So this is the Quebec border here. And if you look at it, we're almost directly, so we're about two hours west of Ottawa and about six hours due north of Toronto. But you can't go due north of Toronto, you have to go around Algonquin Park, so it's a, it's a circuitous route. It's a large facility, lots of uh, buildings, it's like a university campus in a way. There's every 
aspect of science represented there in engineering. Biologists, chemists, engineers, physicists. Um, they make up a relatively small fraction of the workforce. There's about 3,000 employees. About 600 of them are, are scientists and engineers, and the rest are skilled trades, labor, support staff. Uh, it's like a university in every way, except there's no, there's no teaching, there's no students. But sometimes there are. In the summer, there are summer students. Then it's more like a university. Two large research reactors. We don't make electricity at Chalk River. Um, it's, it's a research facility, and we'll talk about what we do there. But just to show you the, uh, the bird's eye view here, there's two large research reactors. This building on the right is called the NRU, for National Research Universal. Just call it the NRU. It's a large 100 megawatt research reactor, and it's what we use today to make um, a large fraction of the world's medical isotopes. The one next to it is the old girl of the, uh, of the site. This is the NRX reactor. And this is the one that was built. This was the reason why Chalk River was built in the first place. When it was built in, 19, in the 1940s, it started in 1947 to actually operate. But when they started building it, it was, the, was for a while, for about 10 years, the largest research reactor in the world. So people know about the Manhattan Project. And that was a huge, massive, multi-billion dollar, couple of billion dollars uh, project. For, in, in those days, was even more money. Um, I mean, like $10 billion equivalent, probably. And that was a huge thing, right? And, um, but still, we have, when they built the NRX reactor, it was the largest research reactor in the world. So with our small focus program, we immediately went to the forefront of, of nuclear research. Okay, so we're going to talk about the history, some of which we've already touched on, um, and how reactors work. I'm going to talk about safety and sustainability of reactors. I think that was one of the focus points you wanted me to touch on today. And then because of the topic of this course, I'm going to give you my thoughts on the contribution of nuclear technology of all types to world peace over the years and potential. So starting off with the history of the program. So 75 years ago, almost to the day in February, uh, fission was discovered. And th what is fission? Well, it's the splitting of the atom. We all know, we've all heard about the splitting of the atom and the energy that comes off. Um, that was not a, tr a trivial thing at the time. They, they knew they could get energy out of atoms by moving the, the electrons around, but the actual splitting of the atomic nucleus itself, they thought was impossible. They didn't think they could do it. And in 1939, they realized they could do it. Not only was it possible, but you had millions of times more energy than any chemical reaction known to date. So everything that we do, Everything that we knew is a, is a chemical reaction. Until that point, they, they didn't even know they could do anything useful with the nucleus. It has over 99% of the atom in that small speck in the middle of the atom. But you, they, couldn't, they, they didn't think you could do anything with it. Until 1939, when all of a sudden, you can control the energy you get out of the atom, and you can, and you can emit millions of times more energy than any chemical reaction. The burning of, of any material generates you know, one millionth of what you get from this. Um, unfortunately, there was also the biggest military conflict in history starting around the same time. So they discovered the, the, the biggest repository of, of energy that can be tapped at the same time as they have the biggest military conflict about to start up in 1939. And so, of course, the first application of all that energy was a nuclear bomb. And this dogs us to this day. We still have nuclear weapons, of course, you know that. And nuclear technology and nuclear, the technology of nuclear power and nuclear weapons, there's, there's some links there. It's, it's the splitting of atoms. And so there's, there's this um, inextricable link, um, but not in the sense that nuclear reactors are in any way like an atomic bomb. However, in, in the public consciousness, th there's, there's that relationship. So this today still dogs us because this is how nuclear technology, this is how fission, which should have been just a great discovery of, of, of humankind, um, was introduced to the world with the dropping of the two bombs in 1945. So during the war, uh, you had research going on in Paris before the, before the Germans came across the border and, and uh, a lot of scientists fled. You had, so 1939, remember, fission is discovered. During the war in 1940, you had researchers working on this amazing way to, to liberate energy from the nucleus. And they realized that a, a material called heavy water, have you heard of heavy water? 
It's one of these strange terms. Well, heavy by itself, not strange. Water by itself, not strange. Put them together, heavy water, what's that? Well, it's a natural part of regular water, but it's really rare. One part in 7,000. So one water molecule out of 7,000 coming out of the tap is 10% heavier than the other molecules because the hydrogen is 10% is, is heavier. Um, well, so what? Well, it just so happens that that material was just an interesting academic material until fission was discovered, and then they realized that this strange material, if you could, if you could concentrate it, is the best way to make a reactor work. And they haven't built a reactor yet, these guys, but they, they know about fission, and they know how they might want to put a reactor together. So they're, they have the world's supply of heavy water, which is about 186 liters. It's hardly anything. It's just a byproduct from some process in Norway, um, which they got their hands on. And they're doing experiments with it. So they're in France doing this. The Germans come across the border. The heavy water and the researchers escape to England, to Cambridge, and continue their research there. Uh, England, also not a great place to be doing work n on nuclear science during the war, so that eventually comes to the colony of England, which is just across the pond, Canada, and that's where our nuclear program came from. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a nuclear program. If it weren't for World War II and the expedient of getting this, this heavy water program, research program, first of all out of France and then out of England, and where are you going to put it? And uh, they didn't want it in the United States because the United States was busy building different types of reactors using graphite and they had a weapons program. And they knew that this type of reactor, if you could build one, would take much longer. It wouldn't contribute to the immediate need, which was, which was the war effort to build a bomb from the U United States point of view. So they let the Canadians have it. And that's how we ended up with a nuclear program uh, based on heavy water reactors. Meanwhile, just as an aside, there's a guy named George Lawrence who's working for the National Research Council in Ottawa. This is 100 Sussex Drive, so it's just down the road from the Parliament buildings in Ottawa, and just up the road from where, the, from where Stephen Harper lives. And uh, this is their labs, and in these labs, people are beavering away during the war, helping the war effort, and this guy, George Lawrence, is, is radiographing, using x-rays to radiograph aircraft parts and teaching the aircraft industry, how to, how to make their airplanes safer. He reads about the science of fission in the papers, in the, in the scientific journals, and he gets permission to build a reactor just down the hall in, in one of the rooms. You could do that back in 1941. Um, if he had had pure materials, uranium, and in his case he's using graphite instead of heavy water, he might have had the first reactor in the world, the first operating reactor, but he didn't. He didn't have a fully funded program. He was just doing this on his, basically, his spare time. But he ends up being the the nuclear guy in Canada that is doing this uh, even before Enrico Fermi builds what was the first reactor in 1942 in Chicago. So the big decision to start the nuclear program in Canada, to bring that heavy water over from England and set something up here was in August 17, 1942. And uh, Clarence Decatur Howe, the Minister of Everything, as he was called during World War II, he's, he made this statement, okay, let's go. And with that statement and his signature, he basically committed what would have been equivalent today, billions and billions and billions of dollars, just, just like that, just saying, we don't know what this nuclear science is. We know that it's gonna be something, that it's gonna do a lot of stuff. Some of the scientists are telling, that you might be able, telling us you might be able to make medical isotopes, whatever that is. It sounds important. If Canada agrees to this request from England to move the, their program over here, we can be on the ground floor of nuclear research. Okay, let's go. And it was off. So, what were they gonna do? Well, the first thing they were gonna do was build, finish the job that those French scientists started during, in 1940, build a reactor that runs on heavy water. And I'll talk about how that works in a second. So they needed a site, and they're in Ottawa. They wanted a site that was not so far from Ottawa but isolated because the war is on, so they wanted secrecy. They wanted safety, so isolation from, from large populated areas. They weren't sure, you know, it's nuclear, and they're just learning about how reactors work. Large body of water is needed. Uh, a, a train track access is there needed for bringing in supplies. So they picked the town of Chalk River, which was an historical town in the woods, about two hours west of Ottawa, and built Chalk River Laboratories, and this is at 1944. So here they're building the world's largest research reactor. And that's the Ottawa River in the background, frozen over as it is at this very moment. 
Looks just like that. That's Quebec in the background. So the war ends. And shortly after the war ends, in, on September 5th, 1945, we became the second country in the world to control nuclear fission. So we're a country that is more known for its natural resources, hockey, uh, valiant soldiers on the battlefield, but not necessarily high-tech science. The war comes to an end. We're now being known for our large navy, for our, our growing aircraft industry, and we have the second largest nuclear infrastructure in the world, and we have, we're the second country to control nuclear fission. In this little reactor here, so this isn't the big NRX reactor that's still being built. It didn't start up until two years later. But in the meantime, they built this little wee one next door, and that's it on the inside, just to sort of test the science. Because hardly anyone's done this yet. So before you build the big reactor, you build a small one. But by doing that, we became the second country to, to uh, achieve that. So the war ends. We find ourselves by uh, random chance and luck and, uh, and because of our geography and because of our history and our affiliation with England, with the second largest nuclear infrastructure on the planet. The United States, obviously, by this time had built the two weapons and they had their sort of orders of magnitude bigger than what our program, but there's no other country on the planet that has any kind of nuclear program. The Germans never did get very far. Uh, England emptied all their science on this topic to Canada, so they don't have anything. We have atomic bomb knowledge because people are talking and they know how these things generally are put together. Um, this could have been a path that we could have gone down at that point. This was a popular idea at the time. You know, these bombs are obviously going to change the way the world works. And so maybe we should have one. So we have that potential in 1945. We are the world's experts on heavy water reactors, which which are, which were then and still are now, the, the, the most efficient way to make a nuclear reactor work. And the only reason they didn't do that in the United States was because it took, a, it took too long and they wanted to get these reactors up and going and then make their bombs and, and, and bomb Japan, or bomb Germany was the original idea. But the, because um, one of the many things you can do with, with reactors in general is to make plutonium for nuclear weapons. We have a lot of the, a lot of the world's uranium supplies, we still do, and we have the world's most powerful research reactor under construction. So where do we go from here? Should we proliferate? Should we be the first country to proliferate and, and make our own weapons? Nobody, nobody would have stopped us at that point. There was no non-proliferation treaty. There was no even a ha gentleman's handshake at the time saying don't, don't build weapons. It was just all um, top secret, and, but uh, sort of OK at the time to do whatever you wanted. Um, well, we were the first country to actually non-proliferate. We were the first country to say, well, the war is over. Uh, we were building this reactor as, as part of a sort of a, a, um, an associated program with the American program, but we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to use this reactor for good instead of evil. And that was always part of the design of this reactor. The one on the left, or, yeah, this is the NRX reactor on the left. And it's just a big cylinder. Uh, the reactor itself is in the middle of a whole bunch of shielding, so it's much smaller than that, that object you see there. But all the stuff around the outside, it's all research. Um, it, it's ways that scientists can access the reactor to use the neutrons, to use the beams of neutrons, to look inside materials, to learn more about exotic nuclei, to make medical isotopes. Nuclear medicine had already been around in sort of um, in, in small amounts because they were using radium to to make radioactive material, which they would put on. Well, radium was, was, was the miracle cure for everything. So in the 30s, the 20s and the 30s, they were using radium. And, but and the radium is, is not, it's just something that you find in the ground. It's not, you can't make it in large quantities, and it's, it's very rare. So they knew they could do stuff, and they were actually thinking, if only we had a way to make this kind of material by the kilogram. We, can use, we know we can use the energy of radioactive decay to to kill cancer, but you need kilograms of material, and you can't get kilograms of material because it's so rare. If only we had a machine that could make kilograms of radioactive material. In 1939, with the discovery of fission, they had a way to make a machine to do that. And that's what the NRX is. Um, and then this is the NRU reactor, which was built 10 years later. Looking down at the top, this circular plate here is, the, is if you will, it's the top of that kind of thing there because the reactor is the same sort of size. 
Um, but it's a much more powerful reactor, and this is the one that's still running today. So with these machines, which ran t side by side, remember the two big buildings in the picture, they're side by side, this Chalk River was the mecca for nuclear research in the world for about 10 or 15 years, because we had that head start. So this, this country with a lot of water and rocks and trees and hockey players and valiant soldiers, as the world knew us, now had the place you go to if you wanted to learn about nuclear science. Well, what did we do with it? Well, one of the first things we did was invent cobalt cancer therapy machines, 1951. So the NRX reactor started up in 1947. By 1951, they were treating patients at the University of Western Ontario Victoria Hospital, that was the first place, with beams of gamma radiation from cobalt-60. And the cobalt-60 was made by putting cobalt-59, which is a naturally occurring element, into the NRX reactor. <coughs> it absorbs neutrons and becomes cobalt-60. You pull it out after a couple of months and it's radioactive. You stick it in an object that has a hole on one end and a beam of, a beam of gamma rays come out, just like x-rays, and you can kill cancer. Still do this today, and it's one of the most effective ways, you know, chemotherapy, radiation therapy. There's a small list of effective ways to fight cancer. So we're very proud of the fact that this was invented by Canadian medical doctors and nuclear scientists working together. Uh, at the same time, there was this race to uh, actually to, to be the first ones to, to make this device. There was a team at the University of Saskatchewan that lost only by, by uh, well, two weeks. So this is the 27th of October, 8th of November. So it was this race to, to be the first to come out with. Then the media had trouble with this because all they knew about nuclear was that it, it makes atomic bombs and now it, it's saving lives, so the, the atomic bomb that saves lives, and that's the yin and the yang of nuclear science that we still live with today. And, and um, the common name for this device actually was the cobalt bomb. So imagine telling a patient that, we're gonna treat you with the cobalt bomb. 1951, we helped create the, we we're on the original board of directors and have been on the board of directors ever since of the International Atomic Energy Agency. Now this is in direct recognition of the fact that uh, it's good for nuclear technology to spread to the world, peaceful nuclear technology, because we can use it to irradiate uh, crops and kill infestation, to, to fight cancer, um, possibly to make uh, cheap and abundant electricity. They hadn't done that yet, but they, they, they were working on the early ideas. Um, however, we don't want that to lead to a spread of nuclear weapons and the two will always be connected. Not that one can be used for the other, but the science is connected. Uh, so if you have smart guys that know about the nucleus, they can probably do both activities. So you have to control it, it needs to be policed. And when Eisenhower made his speech in 1953, which, which has been labeled the Adams for Peace speech, so this marks actually the end of uh, the United States keeping the information to itself, the secrecy period. And it's saying, no, no, it's, it's ethical to let this, let this knowledge and this technology be used around the world, but for peace only. Not Adams only for peace, that wasn't his speech. So he wasn't saying, we, the United States, are gonna get rid of our nuclear weapons. It wasn't Adams only for peace, it was Adams for peace, in addition to us having our nuclear weapons. So they created this agency, the International Atomic a Energy Agency, the IAEA in Vienna, uh, which still to this day polices the use of nuclear the peaceful use of nuclear energy, and you hear about them going into Iran and, and you know, what are you guys doing, you know, that kind of thing. Um, unfortunately, you only hear about their semi-failures and almost failures. You don't hear about the 99% of their work, which is actually quite successful. There are still very few countries on this planet with nuclear weapons. There's more countries now than there were back here, so it's obviously it's not perfect, but um, the policing does work. We built our first nuclear power reactor to make electricity in 1962, around the same time as other countries were doing this. That's it right there in that big, white, boring looking building. And this is on the Ottawa River as well. This is about 10 minutes further west of Chalk River. And this was, a, this was the Atomic Energy of Canada working with uh, what's today Ontario Power Generation and General Electric, which is in Peterborough. So General Electric was the engineering firm that designed the reactor. Ontario Power Generation, uh, note, they're the ones that had the grid and, and the connections and to the grid, and then we, AECL was the nuclear science. 
So today, there's 18 reactors operating in, in, uh, in Canada. Most of them are in Ontario, and half of the electricity comes from, from nuclear. Most of the, of the, the uh, country is not nuclear. Canada is largely a water-powered and coal-powered country. Some provinces like Saskatchewan are, most, are almost all coal, and some uh, provinces, and some provinces like Quebec are almost all water. But Ontario is unique in that it's half nuclear. And then the other fractions are provided by high water and, and natural gas. So these are the, st the stations around uh, Ontario. There's the Pickering Station that I showed on the first slide. Uh, Darlington is further down the highway in, in uh, Oshawa. There's the first one, a uh, nuclear power demonstration. And then Douglas Point is, is on Lake Huron, on the same location as the Bruce Nuclear Station, which today is, is the biggest station in North America, I think, if not, I if not the world. It's, it's a mass, it's eight nuclear reactors there, and, and it's just massive. So one-fifth of the power of, of the province comes from this one station. And then there's two in Quebec, which are currently not operating. Uh, so that's a historical picture. And there's one that is operating in, in New Brunswick. Around the world, there's 12 more reactors. Uh, four in South Korea, one in Argentina, two in, in Romania, and two more being built. Uh, two in India, one in Pakistan, and two in China. And these are the two newest candy reactors built. And as well as building the reactors, we also built this peninsula. You can imagine what kind of a project that would have been. Okay, so how reactors work. Ah, the pie chart of where electricity comes from. How many, by the way, knew the fraction of, of nuclear electricity in, in the province? Two, two, three. Um, this, if you go to this website here, it will show you the instantaneous snapshot. Where is, is your electricity coming from at this instant, or in the last hour, actually? Breaks it down. And it usually looks something like this. The, the big green section is, is nuclear. That's 57%. And this is at f almost 5 p.m. on February 24th. So it's supper hour on February 24th. So uh, almost 60% of the province is nuclear, and then the blue one is, is uh, water, and the red one is gas, natural gas, and 9% here is, is wind. So the wind is actually generating more electricity at this point than the natural gas. And also on this website, further down, it, it breaks it down by well, over the last 48 hours. And also further down, it will show you every single generating station in Ontario, all the wind turbines, all the, all the natural gas stations, all the hydro dams, and all the nuclear stations, what they're generating, what they're supposed to be, what they can generate if they're running full, full out, and what they are currently. Um, so this shows you, over the last 48 hours, what each of the sources provided to the, to the province. The green is... is um, is nuclear, and it's just it's base load power. Nuclear, all the nuclear reactors are on all the time. There's always there's always electricity needed in the province, even in the middle of in four o'clock in the morning. There's still electricity being used, and that's provided by the nuclear stations. They they run the they run the plants in the order of cost of electricity and um, and increasing pollution. So the first thing they would try and use are all the hydro stations, all the, all the water stations, because you can't beat falling water for cleanliness and, and cheapness of, of fuel supply. Uh, the second cheapest and cleanest way to make electricity in Ontario are the, are the nuclear stations. And then the ones you want to run least are the natural gas stations. And so there, that's why that's the, the brown here, I guess. And the wind, uh, sorry, uh, the wind is the brown. Natural gas at this point is the red, yeah. Um, the wind turbines you just use whenever the wind is blowing. You just they, 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 they run, they use whatever they can, and that's showing you here the contribution. Okay, so a can-do reactor, if you could slice it in down the half, those, those ominous-looking concrete dome buildings you see, like a pickering, if you slice it in half, that's what you see. If you were to look inside any kind of power generation plant, it would look similar. If you just stand back and kind of wink, it, 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 would, it would look similar. The only thing that's different here is this thing in the, in the middle, which is the reactor itself. Everything else is just a steam engine, boiling water to make steam, to turn a turbine, to make electricity. If you were to re replace this with, a, with a, a coal fired furnace to boil the water, that would be a coal station. And over to the left would be a big pile of coal. 
and behind that would be a big stack, and that's where all the waste would go from the, from the burning. Um, so this is where the fission is taking place, all the heat, and the heat is extracted in by this light bulb shaped object, which is just a boiler. There's just regular water in that. The fuchsia shaped stuff is, is uh, steam, and the steam turns a turbine, the turbine turns a generator, the generator makes electricity, and out it goes to the grid. And the reactor is inside this dome structure, which we call the containment building, and it's there to contain the reactor and all nuclear uh, elements. Everything that's nuclear is, is kept inside that building. And it's a very, uh, you don't think it's very strong looking from my little thin red line here, but it's actually about five feet thick concrete walls reinforced. It is the strongest structure we probably build with, this, with uh, civil engineering in, in, uh, in Ontario. And it's there to contain the entire energy that's in that reactor. We know how much energy is there because we know how much heat is there, and we know how much water is there. And the worst thing that can happen is that that water comes in direct contact with that heat and, and flashes into steam, and now you've got a huge steam pressure. That would be a bad accident. So you say to the civil engineers, design me a building that can withstand this pressure pulse. And that's what you see built around all the reactors. Not all reactors in the world have buildings like that. The reactors you know about in the news that have had accidents have not had those structures. And that's why they're in the news. So good idea to have these structures. All reactors in Canada have these. All reactors in the United States have these. And in the Western world. Uh, some reactors, like the, the Chernobyl reactor, um, didn't have that at all. The Fukushima reactor sort of partially had containment, but not very well an old design. Um, Three Mile Island, 1979, that was the first big accident. It had a containment building. And that was a bad accident, but it was contained. There was no release from that accident. So the reactor itself was destroyed, but the, the building worked. Although, although publicly there was a big, um, there was a lot of fear. There was a, an unnecessary evacuation. People got hurt evacuating, but the, there was no emissions from the plant itself. And the plant, the reactor itself was, was a write-off of course. So looking inside that building, if you could look at a real one, well this is a CAD drawing, three-dimensional three CAD drawing. It's a much more complicated structure inside than I was showing on the schematic. That's all I want to get across with this picture. Here's my five foot thick concrete walls. There's the reactor in the middle and then a lot of other stuff. These are your light bulb shaped uh, boilers. There's, there's more than one of them. Usually there's four or eight. And then a lot of concrete. So it's a very, very strong structure with a reactor nestled in the middle of it. And that's its intention. So what's in the reactor itself? Here's nuclear fission 101. So this is when we say we split the atom, what's happening, right? So you have a neutron, which we call a slow neutron, because it's going only one kilometer a second. And that is a slow speed for a small particle. Uh, it whams into a uranium nucleus. Now this is not the, the atom itself with all the electrons around it, this is just the nucleus itself, where 99% of the mass of, the, of the, uh, the atom is. If, to give you an idea of how much empty space there is around this, if this nucleus, which, well actually that size there, but the size of a soccer ball, say, so if that was that size that you see, then the next nucleus over, its neighboring nucleus, in a chunk of uranium metal, would be six kilometers that way, and the next one that way is six kilometers, and six kilometers that way. So there's this 12 kilometer by 12 kilometer by 12 kilometer cube of empty space before you get to the next nucleus. So that's how much empty space there is in matter. If I could, if I could um, zoom in to you guys, or this table, you would just enough to see at the atomic level, you would just see empty space. And, and all the mass is in this tiny, tiny, tiny dot in the center. That's what our neutron has to hit. It's amazing that it does it at all. Uh, this is partly why it wasn't even discovered until later in, in much later in the uh, evolution of, of science. Because uh, they had learned a lot about atoms, but they, this was a mystery to them. When you hit it with a neutron, the neutron is just one of the two particles that are in the nucleus itself. It splits in half. What does it turn into? Well, it turns into things that are about half the, the mass of uranium itself. Xenon, iodine, krypton, and they are radioactive. So these fission products are radioactive, and that's what makes spent fuel radioactive when it comes out of a reactor. Not because of the uranium. Uranium is in the ground, and there's uranium in your cells, there's uranium in the, in the, in the building. It's just a natural part of, of nature 
and it's not a, a concern. But this stuff that's created is radioactive, and that's why spent fuel has to be uh, monitored and, and kept isolated from the biosphere. When it splits in half, you get a lot of energy. That's the million times of more energy than anything known to date at the time in 1939 that, that amazed everybody. Also, the fact that you create, you, you emit two or three more neutrons. So this was what blew their minds, that you had not only all this energy, but at the end of it, you had particles coming off, which are the same particles that went into the process. So you have a chain reaction. The problem is they're going too fast. So you've got to slow them down. That's where the heavy water comes in. If I was to throw a, a, a baseball at you at 95 miles per hour and ask you to catch it, you'd have difficulty. You'd probably get out of the way. Uh, but even if you tried to catch it, you've got to be able to move your hand quick enough. And um, if I were to instead take that same ball and lob it at you as slow as I possibly can, keeping it in the air, like throwing a softball, you have a better chance of catching it. And that's what the uranium has to do. It has to catch these, these neutrons. That's why the fast neutrons, even though you might think fast, more energy, it's going to wham into the uranium and cause more damage. It doesn't work that way. These, these uh, neutrons got to be slowed down. And so that's what, in France, they figured you could do with heavy water. And in the United States, they figured you could do with graphite. And George Lawrence, working in Ottawa, figured you could do with graphite. What are you doing with these materials? Well, you're just bouncing the neutrons off the atoms, just like billiard balls, because they're all the same size. And uh, different materials do this more, better than others. Heavy water does this the best of anything. Remember, this is a natural substance, one part in 7,000. So you've invested some energy and time and money to extract this. But once you've got this pure heavy water, it's bouncing the neutrons around, and it's not absorbing any. And that's the key. Regular water works as well, but it will absorb a certain fraction of the neutrons. And when you absorb them, they don't come out the other side, and you don't have a chain reaction. So you can't just stick uranium in water and have a chain reaction happen. You have to do something different. You have to either enrich your uranium, your concentration of uranium, or enrich your water, turn it into heavy water. So you're putting your energy and money into one of these two items. Canadian reactors enrich the water. American-style reactors, light water reactors, enrich the uranium from less than 1% uranium-235. That's the, the isotope that does the fissioning up to about 3 or 5%. Okay, that's fission. So pull back a little bit, and that's what's happening in the, in the reactor. This is that thing that was in the, the bottom of the containment building. All the heat is being generated in a whole bunch of these things. So every one of these yellow rectangles is a can-do fuel bundle. And there are actually 12 of these arranged on end in each of these fuel channels. And there's 400 fuel channels. So there's about 5,000 of these guys. And each one of these provides enough electricity for, for a, a, an average Ontario home for 100 years. Now, it doesn't stay in the reactor for 100 years. It stays in the reactor for about a year. So one bundle equals one home for 100 years, or one bundle equals 100 homes for a year. That's a better way of putting it. Um, and you have 5,000 of them. And that's how you have, if you have eight reactors, like a Pickering, each with, all, with those 5,000 bundles, each p powering 100 homes, that's how the city of Toronto gets mo a lot of its electricity. I'll pass this around. This is an empty can-do bundle. There's no fuel in it. If it was full of uranium, it would weigh about 20 kilograms, so it would be quite hefty, because uranium is, is, is quite dense. Now that, um, so one home, one average Ontario home for 100 years. Another way of putting that is if you're a family of four living in a home, or five, or whatever, living in a home, and um, if you got all your electricity, 100% of your electricity from nuclear only, that would be the amount of fuel you would need for 100 years. That would also be the size of the waste products, because that comes out of the reactor looking just like that, and all of the waste products are in that fuel bundle. So that's the volume. If you ever wonder if we got my electricity from nuclear, how much waste would I create, would I be responsible for? Well, that's it. And that just speaks to the incredible concentration of energy in, in nuclear. If it wasn't as concentrated as that, I don't think there would be as much incentive to, to, uh, to exploit it. It's, it's because there's a lot of expense for the safety and, and, and uh, all the other infrastructure around the reactor to get it working. 
fishing itself is dead simple, but the engineering of it is where the expense comes in. So there's got to be some payback, and the payback is that you get, you know, that's your waste for a family for 100 years. So remember I said fuel channels, uh, 12 of these on end in each fuel channel and 400 channels, so that's what we got right here. Uh, we call this a calandria. That's a $10 word for can on its side with tubes going through it. <laughs> it comes from the, um, the, the, the beer making industry, I think. Thank you. And some wag back in the 40s or 50s decided it was a good word to apply to this because it's sort of what it looks like. You can see the size. This is a relatively small calandria, but that's the reactor itself. Generally, they're about six meters in diameter and about six meters long. Just a, a can sitting on its side with tubes going through it, filled with thousands of these, each one running 100 homes with electricity. Another look at it, this is, this is a bigger one, and these guys are they're building the reactor here, so um, normally you wouldn't be standing next to it like this when it's running. But you can see here the plumbing nightmare, getting heavy water to flow into each of those channels. Now this slide puts one against the other, just to show you that I wasn't lying when I said that all of the other stuff that makes electricity is really the same as what you'd see in a, in a fossil plant. This is a coal station, there's your pile of coal, there's your waste management system, and here you have your turbine, your generator, your, your transformer, and your, and your power to the grid. And the only difference is how you make the heat, how you, how you boil the water. In this case, you're just pulverizing coal and, and, and burning it. And what you do with your waste as well. Um, both, both types of stations, uh, these are called thermal power stations that, that boil water to make electricity. All of thermal power stations, regardless of whether it's fossil or nuclear, um, will, have, will need to turn this steam, this regular water steam that's running the, the turbine back into, to condense it back into water and put it back in the boiler. So you want this circuit here. You don't want this water to escape because you've cleaned this water up and deionized it and demineralized it and it's expensive regular water. So you condense it and put it back into the boiler and it turns the steam, goes through the turbine, gets condensed back into water and away it goes. The way you condense it is by bringing in cold water from some nearby lake. And that's why all the stations, whether it's coal, oil, gas, or nuclear, are built on a lake. And it's, see the same thing here. Okay, so where does the waste go? Well, the waste goes next door in, at the station. So all of the, all of the bundles that have been ever in a nuclear reactor in, in Canada are still at the stations and they're still warm to a certain extent when they come out of the reactors so they're kept underwater for cooling and also shielding because those fission products are, are uh, radioactive and even though they're, they're encased in the, in the fuel which is still in here and the fission products are only going to be about 0.1% of the mass of the material, it's still mostly just uranium but that 0.1% is giving off a lot of gamma rays which are like x-rays and so you still need to shield the workers, and so water is a pretty good shield. 30 feet of water is a, is a good shield, and also the water is cooling it, because it's also generating a little bit of heat. There's no more fission going on in the spent fuel. There's no more uranium atoms splitting, but the fission products are decaying and giving off energy. So this is all the fuel that was used by the uh, Point Le Pro station in New Brunswick for over, over 20 years, roughly. If you were to take all the bundles in Canada that have ever been created, which is about two million bundles, since 1962, when that first one was built in Ralston, Ontario, near Chalk River, um, and you stacked them up like firewood, you would cover a soccer field to about the height of a player. So that's to give you an idea of the volume, um, which, relatively speaking, is not a large volume for uh, 60 years of over six, for 60 years of power, roughly speaking. Um, once the fuel has been cooled in those pools for uh, about seven years, then they can be moved to above-ground storage I, um, casks or monoliths. These are just concrete um, structures, and, you, and you're just stacking the fuel up, and they're air-cooled. Extremely simple technology. You can see it's right next to the plant itself. And you just keep building these simple concrete structures. Very robust. Um, the, the, these can withstand quite a lot. You can imagine, if, you know, um, if something runs into this, it's probably the something which is going to be damaged and not this thing. And the technology is, is relatively simple. There's no moving parts. There's no pumps. There's no electricity running, cooling, cooling the fuel. Uh, this is not a long-term solution. Well, I, it is actually. Um, it's long-term in, in terms of maybe 
you know, 50 to 100 years, that kind of time frame. Um, but there's still structures, there's still man-made structures. And so ethically, you want to plan uh, the end game for your, your mess, right? So you, you want to make sure that you're not leaving something that has to be monitored by society, even if it's 100 years from now or 200 years, you, want, you don't want them to be um, having to look after your mess. And, um, and we do that actually with a lot of our mess as human beings, right? We, we, we do leave a lot of junk for our great, great, great grandchildren to look after. But one thing that we have thought more about is nuclear fuel because it gets a lot of attention. And the idea, and we don't do this yet, but this is the plan, is to put the stuff back in the ground because nature has looked after radioactive uranium for four and a half billion years. You dig a hole in the ground a kilometer deep and you put it back down in there. You pick a spot that's isolated, that doesn't have interesting mineral deposits that's likely to be exploited by civilizations in the future. Um, no groundwater flow, no seismic activity. That describes a good fraction of northern Canada, actually. So we have a, uh, lots of opp opportunity, opportunities up there to, to uh, pick a spot. Well, we also have a lot of time to do this because this fuel is, is it's small. So you saw how big those pools were, you can, those concrete structures. You can build those things you know, as many as you need. There's no need to rush into doing this. One reason why you might not want to rush into doing this is because you can still get energy out of that fuel if you wanted to. Now, it's much cheaper to go get more uranium in the ground and build a new fuel bundle. But if you didn't have uranium in the ground, now it's one of the most abundant things on the planet, so it's, there's a lot of it. But if, say, in a hundreds of years from now, you're running out of uranium, you can still get 100 times the energy out of this. So this, in its life in the reactor, gave electricity to 100 homes. It can now give electricity to 10,000 more, if you wanted to through a slightly more expensive process of extracting the uranium and putting it into a slightly different type of reactor, called a fast reactor, which we don't have. And we don't need them because we have the mother load of uranium in Canada. So as the economics change, this might be a supply of fuel for my great, 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 great grandchildren. So if you're going to put the fuel in the ground, uh, make it so it's retrievable, so that it's a mine of uranium for the future. All right, safety and sustainability. Okay, so nuclear safety philosophy basically follows these steps. Number one is you build a really good system. You get your engineers on the job and you say, make something that's not going to fall apart. Tolerant of mechanical failure and human failure, human error. Um, and that's something that you're not going to be perfect at, but you do a really, we know more and more now about how to make things that are, are going to, with, they're flexible and they're designed to withstand um, mechanical problems or people screwing up. Uh, and stick some really in, you know, intelligent people in charge of this thing. So training is important. But assume that you've made a mistake and that accidents will happen. Assume that you've, you've not thought of everything because it's probably 100% certain that you did not think of everything. Um, so you build systems to prevent and control accidents. So you think of all the possible accidents that can happen. You build systems that can shut off your reactor as in under two seconds. You, you build not just one system, but you build a second system. And you make your second system completely different from your first system, located in a different part of the reactor, works on different principle. It has its own detectors that tell it when to fire. And test these systems all the time. Um, don't have one computer controlling your plant. Have two computers, just like the space shuttle has three computers controlling it at all times. So there's two that are backup. Every reactor in Canada has two computers separately thinking it's running the plant and one's a backup. Test the si systems frequently and improve with operational experience as you go along. So in other words, you're continuously Im improving the, the, the safety. Now we call the, the overall safety philosophy de defense in depth. And that's a, we didn't invent, invent this term. This comes from, I believe it's a military term. I think it's how you protect your, your fort, defense in depth. You have increasingly large radii of barriers that will stop the, uh, the intruders. So thinking of this in a safety aspect, um, where does your problem start? Your problem's gonna start with your fuel. This is where your, your energy is, that you, and the energy you wanna be under control. So you start by having robust fuel. By that I mean you have a high temperature ceramic fuel that can stand uh, 2,000 degrees Celsius. It's sitting in the reactor at 100 atmospheres pressure. The water flowing over it is 300 degrees Celsius and it's under pressure, so it's not boiling at that point, but it's, it's a very 
um, violent environment, and you design this. This looks like just you know 28 metal rods slapped together, but there's an incredible amount of engineering. Every little weld in here is a, is just not a random weld. It's a specially designed weld, and it's all checked. So you make your fuel so it's going to be able to contain all the waste products, even if it overheats. To contain the waste products. That's what you start with. Then you, can, you have two independent control systems that are running the reactor, so two independent com computers, three independent ways to shut down the reactor, in, including the, c the control system, system itself, and then you have two other ways to shut the reactor down in under two seconds. And, and when I say shut it down, it's, there's no more fission happening. It's, the reactor is turned off. Um, you want to build in many ways to cool the reactor, not just the, way, not just the water flowing up here with, with pumps running it, because sometimes pumps don't have electricity. Like at the Fukushima uh, accident in, J in Japan, they had all kinds of pumps. And they had backup pumps, and they had backup diesel generators and batteries, and all of that was washed away or drowned in, in, underwater and, and stopped working. So even if all that happens, wouldn't it be great to have your reactor still able to cool itself? And if you think about putting a pot on the stove with a big pot of hot water, right? The water is heated at the bottom, the hot water flows, if you could put dye in there, you would see the hot water flowing to the top and then cooling and then going to the bottom again, and you get the circulation. So can-do reactors, are, and a lot of Western design reactors, have that ability that it's, it's not by coincidence that the heat source is at the bottom of the plant and the heat sink, or where you take the heat away, is at the top. So even if you take away all the electricity to the pumps, that water is still going to burp its way around the reactor and cool it. And it'll just sit there doing that for days and days and days. And again, the reactors you've heard about that have had accidents did not have the capability. So that's the, what I mean by many independent ways to cool the reactor. Um, that, by the way, is a worst case scenario, that you have all your electricity not available, and no backup systems, no batteries. That's, that's wor like the, what happened in Japan, total blackout, that's worst case scenario. What's more likely to happen is you, you get a, a blackout, just uh, the, the grid goes down, and there's no electricity running your pumps anymore. So your backup systems kick in. And you store water in the, in the top of your building, just a, an extra source of water to, that by gravity itself, which doesn't need electricity to move it, can, can cool the reactor. Um, around the whole thing, you build a containment building, which I call the what-if building, because we're assuming that we've not thought of everything. So we, we build the what-if building. And uh, an example of what-if is what if somebody flies a 747, you know, a terrorist. And we didn't think of that until 9-11. And all of a sudden, oh, OK, what would happen? Well, it turns out that even though these buildings are designed to withstand high pressure from the inside out, the reactor itself generating the energy, it, because they're so robust, they can actually withstand something from the outside hitting it. So um, this, this is just sort of joking. But what I say is if I, had a, if I knew somehow that there was a terrorist flying a, a, a 747, and I had a choice of where to go, where to stand, I would go to the nearest can do a nuclear containment building and stand right next to the reactor, which is the last place I bet most people would say they'd want to go. But uh, what would happen is the airplane would hit it, it would, it would vaporize. Even if the engine itself hit square on, which is the biggest inertial element of the airplane, um, it would just bounce off it. The reactor would sense the seismic movement. It would shut itself down, start cooling itself. Um, everything around that building would be wiped away by this accident. People would be dead. There would be a huge catastrophe. But the reactor would be sitting in the center burping the water around, waiting for the, its next instruction. And this was from analysis done after 9-11 to see what would happen. Um, and then you have this exclusion zone. So when you ha whenever you have a reactor power plant uh, and you get a license to run that, part of the license says you've got to have this you know, real estate around it where no one can, can live uh, permanently. You can have day parks and things. So you see these day parks around Pickering. Um, you see the kids playing on the beach in that, in that picture. But it's just uh, if there was an accident, uh, the further you get away, the, the, the better it is. So it helps with emergency management. And that's the same with any uh, you know, p potential release uh, item in society. Um, so these are the, uh, the, the, the two independent shutdown systems. This is the candy reactor on its side. These are the fuel channels. And we have rods that drop in. The rods are just made out of neutron-absorbing material. 
Uh, when you're shutting a reactor down, you want to be absorbing neutrons, so you make your rods out, these, these rods out of cadmium or boron, things that just happen to absorb neutrons. They drop in, and like a break, instantly the reactor stops. Um, you can also squirt in liquid gadolinium nitrate, and the gadolinium absorbs neutrons like a sponge as well. So these are just two elements that happen to absorb neutrons. And two completely physically different ways of shutting the reactor down, liquid and solid. One is by high pressure with a uh, helium tank pressurizing it, and one's by just gravity. So you're depending on, on different processes. And they can both shut the reactor down in under two seconds. And again, we have very smart people running the plants. We don't have this guy. <laughs> Although I look somewhat like him, but still, we don't have that guy. To run, to be a, an operator at a nuclear plant in Ontario, you've, you've got to train for at least eight years. So you, it's equipped after high school, so it's equivalent of, of, of getting you know, a PhD degree. And you start off, your salary is basically equivalent to as if you had gone through to be a medical doctor. It's a very high paying job. I mean, it's a very high pressure job. And um, only, a, you know, not everybody gets through the process. And you're constantly, there is a, uh, a person there on site from the federal regulator who can slap down a, a test at any time during each year. And you have to get a certain, you know, 80% or higher. So you've got to stay on top of things. And these, these guys, these Homer Simpsons that are running, the real Homer Simpsons, that are running the reactors, they know more about the plant than I do. Because I know about the fuel. I'm a reactor physicist, so I can, I can model that any, as long as you want in a, in a computer. But I don't know how the pressurizer works or, the, or the, the coolant pumps, and these guys know all about that, so they're not going any, any, any more. All right, let's talk about sustainability. Oh, that's a fancy word that gets abused a lot, so what do I mean by it? Well, I'm just saying, what are we doing so that we're not uh, leaving a mess for our great-grandkids, and they can at least have as good a life as I have, or maybe even better? All right, so the first item is, is the waste stream. I've talked about this. The, the fuel is small, and so the waste is small. So that is the, this is not only the fuel that goes in, it's also what the waste looks like. If this was a fossil, you know, like, like a chunk of wood, it, or no, it's not fossil, but if it was a, a chunk of wood, or a chunk of coal, or, or this volume of oil or gas, um, it, it, wasn't, it does not look at this shape when, it, when it's finished, right? It's, it's gone, it's, it's turned into gases and it's up a stack, or it's gone through filters, or you have sludge to deal with. So we do have highly radioactive waste, but it's small in volume and easy to manage. How much waste? Well, one reactor powers the city and generates about a 10-foot cube of waste, which I put into a nice truck, which is a relatively small chunk of waste. Um, so there's my comparison or my uh, statement about all the fuel taking up the volume of a soccer field to the height of a player. Um, and interestingly, I calculated this a little while ago. Because uh, I don't know if Toronto does this anymore, but they were trucking uh, municipal garbage to Michigan. For a while, they we don't do it anymore in Toronto. Yeah. But so when that was happening, there was there was data about how many trucks are going on a daily basis. So it was easy to calculate how much garbage Toronto calculates. So in terms of volume, uh, all the fuel, all the spent fuel generated in the history of nuclear power in Canada, is one half the volume of garbage that the city of Toronto generates every single day. So on on a purely volume comparison, it's, it's not an issue. Toxicity is a different topic. Now, garbage is toxic too. I wouldn't eat the garbage from Toronto either. I'm sure you would last about as long, but um, it's just to say that it's not a big volume. We know how to deal with the volume of, of waste that we have coming out of these reactors. Uh, and then there is the long-term plan that I talked about. It's in place. It was approved in 2007. It's underway. There are about 20 communities, mostly in Ontario, that have said we would like to host this, this deep geologic repository, this mine where you're going to put the spent fuel back in the ground. Um, and, well, we're not, not that we want to host them, we're thinking about hosting them. That's very important. They have not committed, but they're interested in learning more. And so they're, they're going through a process of being approved. And uh, part of that process is to look at where they are and say, well, do you have, like, what's under your town? Do you have a large block of granite that's not... Uh, doesn't have groundwater mo moving through it and that kind of thing. And so a, a couple towns, more than a couple already, in that process have been excluded for those reasons. Just geologically, they're not suitable. 
Uh, they also ask social questions like, um, okay, so the town leaders say they want to host this site. What do the town people say? So is there a, a, a rift here going on? And, and then they investigate. And if, this, if it's going to cause a problem, then, that, then the town is excluded as well. So there's got to be support socially and technically. Okay, so the waste, the waste story is actually a good story for nuclear, which is not what you've heard probably. Nuclear waste is manageable, it's small, it's highly radioactive but so is the universe. We know how to deal with, with, with radiation. Ah, here's my other um, sound bite that one can do fuel bundle, which you've now held in, in your hands, which is uh, 23 kilograms, gives a family of four its electricity needs for 100 years. Cute family. Then there's the clean air story. Um, and this is only because the, the energy is concentrated. If it's concentrated, uh, then it's going to produce less waste. And so how much less? Well, one can-do bundle, so pr providing the electricity for a family for 100 years, what would that be if it was coal? It'd be 400 tons, or 60,000 gallons of oil, or 10 million cubic feet of natural gas. And then they have their environmental uh, repercussions. And you can see the volume multiplies. You go from 400 tons of coal to 1,000 tons of CO2, because the coal oxidizes and gets stuck to oxygen atoms, and, and the mass grows. Contribution to world peace. Okay, so here's my, my thoughts on... Uh, see, this is the same globe, I think, or same earth you have on your <laughs> thing there. Yeah, same, same JPEG. Okay. Uh, so, number one, it reduces the world dependence on centralized oil supply. So anytime you're not um, dependent upon that one sector of the world where a lot of the... Where a lot of the uh, violence comes from and also has a lot of the oil, the, the Middle East is, is a good thing. And that's true for the oil sands too, and they can make the same statement, and the natural gas and shale and fracking, they can all say that. But uh, nuclear does that as well, and it does it better than those, others, those other technologies because of the, we have a lot of uranium in Canada. We supply one third of the world's supply of uranium, and uh, it's going to last for many, many centuries. Global access to nuclear medicine and cancer therapy. So those are still around today. When you go into the hospital and you, and you get a, do a stress test, or you run on a, on a treadmill, you guys don't, right? Because you're young and you're healthy, but maybe you will eventually, or somebody you know who's older than you has done this. You get a stress test, and they inject you with a, with a nuclear radio isotope. So they can see where your blood's going, and if, if your heart is getting all the blood supply it's supposed to, and if part of your heart is not getting the blood supply it's supposed to, it won't show up on the camera that they're looking at your body, looking at the energy coming off. Um, so that nuclear radioisotope, that pharmaceutical, is made likely, uh, if you're in North America, at the NRX reactor in Chalk River. So we invented it. This whole science was invented in, in the 60s and 50s, and we still do it today. We ship that stuff around the world, and same with the, with the cancer therapy machines, the, the cobalt cancer therapy. So, and you, you don't need um, fancy cyclotrons in hospitals. You go to the nuclear medicine center in, in the hospitals in Toronto, and you're going to have all sorts of things there. You're going to have PET scans and MRI machines, right? They're all good. They all have their pros and cons. PET scans are good, but, you, but they're expensive, and you need a cyclotron right there. So in the hospital, there'd be the PET scan machine, and right next to it is a cyclotron, probably making the, making the isotope that's going into the PET scan, or into the patient. And um, you can't have those in third world countries. Just not enough infrastructure, money, whatever, to run those machines. Electricity, reliable electricity. But you can ship a vial of pharmaceutical made in Chalk River that is just in a syringe, and, and then the gamma camera itself is a rel relatively simple um, uh, instrument. So, one of the things that makes me very proud to work at Chalk River is to know that we not only invented these two things, but we continue to supply them to, to the world. We can also irradiate food. So, the gamma rays are just like x-rays. You can, you can take that same cobalt-60 that we use to kill cancer, and you can kill bugs, you can kill bacteria. Uh, we sterilize um, every surgical instrument in North America is sterilized with gamma radiation that comes from cobalt-60, which was probably made in, at Chalk River. 
Every Band-Aid you put on is, was been sterilized. You can, you can sterilize, to, you can kill the germs in a Band-Aid. Think of it, it's a, it's a paper product, right? There's only a few, few ways to sterilize it. You can use heat, you can use chemicals, or you can irradiate it with energy. You can't use heat because it's paper powered products, it'll, it'll burn up or you'll degrade it. Uh, you, you don't want to put chemicals on, on this thing you're going to put on an on a open wound. But you can put the Band-Aid inside the package, seal the package, and then pass energy through the package, leaving no energy behind but killing the bacteria on the way through. And that's done to every bandage, not just Band-Aids, but surgical bandages as well. We, uh, we reduce the environmental impact of electricity production, and, um, and that's got to be good for peace, that you, you just have to look at countries in the world that, that don't reduce the environmental impact. Look at China, where they burn everything. They're, they're building lots of reactors, they're also building lots of dams, and they're burning coal, and it's not clean coal, it's dirty coal, and they're just building these things by the thousands. And, um, and then you look at the human rights issues that you have in countries that are doing that, and there's a connection there. Uh, and we control the spread of nuclear weapons via the Non-Proliferation Treaty with nuclear power. How do we do that? Now, the Non-Proliferation Treaty you've talked about, okay? So you know nuclear power is one of the pillars of it. There's the three, uh, first, before I talk about that, some nice pictures here. Uh, cancer therapy machines, how they look nowadays, so that's more like the 70s probably. And uh, this is nuclear medicine looking inside someone's brain, I guess, using nuclear isotopes. A Canadian gift to the world. So the Non-Proliferation Treaty has these three pillars. Disarmament, which is the pillar, the, uh, one of the three that probably hasn't had the most success since it was, uh, came into force in the 70s. Non-proliferation, which is mostly known for preventing the spread of nuclear weapons. But the third pillar is, is to support nuclear energy. So it says atoms for peace, the yin and the yang. Letting the world have nuclear technology, but preventing them from having nuclear weapons. And by and large, it's been, it's been successful with some exceptions. And that first pillar of, of disarmament, not very successful at all. But there is that article in the NPT that the nuclear weapons countries have signed to say that yes, we will put some serious thought to getting rid of our nuclear weapons at some point. <coughs> it's in there. Uh, okay, so we were part of that setting up of that, of that treaty. We were the first uh, let's see, 1960, some history here. 1965, we, we stopped selling uranium for any use other than, than peaceful uses. So in the early days, we just sold uranium, period. So United States, you want some uranium? You can have it. But now, from 65 onwards, we said, if you want to have Canadian uranium, it's got to be, go into a nuclear reactor for peaceful purposes. And then in 1972, Canada, Canada was the first country to sign its safeguards agreement with the IAEA. So this is the agreement that says, you can come to our country with your inspectors and look at our reactors, look in our pool of water that has the spent fuel and count the bundles and make sure that all the spent fuel is there, and that we haven't taken a spent fuel bundle away and chemically extracted plutonium and put that into a nuclear weapon. And also, do you know, you could take this bundle, right, that you've had it passed around, it's, it has no uranium in it. You could take out a real bundle and put this in there. And how do you know it's a fake bundle? Because they all look the same, right? So this is where the technology comes in, because the real spent fuel is giving off signature radiation, not just any radiation, but it's, it's the radiation of those isotopes. And you can tell how much is in there and, whether it's, and how long it's been in the pool and that kind of thing. So we were the first ones to sign up, and we've been under safeguards ever since. And then since 1997, we've had what's called the additional protocol. And this is really the post-Iraq war uh, addition to safeguards, which says the original safeguards was you tell us where your reactors are and how much fuel you have, and we'll come and look in your pool and count the fuel and say, yes, you got that. But then if you've got a building next door, which is not on the list, we can't go into that building because you didn't put it on the list. So we're, we're only verifying what you say is on the list. Well, the additional protocol says, hey, we can go anywhere we want, and we can fly over your country and do sniffing. And, and uh, this is because um, of the realization in the 90s that countries were able to have clandestine projects going on even though you were doing all the proper safeguards on their nuclear facilities. So are their declarations not just accurate, which is traditional safeguards, but also complete? 
So in other words, when an inspector comes to Chalk River Laboratories, they can look at the NRU reactor and look at the fuel, and then they can say, show me Jeremy Whitlock's office. And then they have to go over there and, you know, okay, just a bunch of junk, right? Okay, there's no, the Geiger counter, don't see anything in there. That is my, uh, that is my talk, and these are some websites. The first one is AECL that I work for. The second one is the Canadian Nuclear Association. That's a, um, that's the, the lobby group for the industry, so they have some interesting educational um, resources you might want to have a look at. This is my website, Nuclear FAQ, not Nuclear FAG, as it's often mistaken as. And this is the regulator, nuclearsafety.gc.ca, the, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. They also have educational resources and they explain things like um, we're repatriating high enriched uranium from Chalk River to the United States. Why are we doing it and how is it safe? How is it going to be done? They talk about that because they're in charge of uh, overseeing the project from a regulatory point of view, making sure that Canadians understand it as well. And this is me here and my email address. Thank you.